Today on Let the Bible Speak. The Bible reveals the church as it existed in the past, but what does that imply about its present and its future? We have a few minutes today to study one of the greatest themes in the history of mankind, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we conclude a series on the church that Jesus established when He left for glory 2,000 years ago. So far we have spent much of our time looking at the historical picture of the church. But today we want to look ahead. It's one thing to look at the New Testament and see the church as it existed then, but 2,000 years have passed and, well, there's a lot of theological water under the bridge, so to speak. What of the church today and even looking toward the future? Should we concern ourselves with patterning ourselves today after the church so long ago? Is that church still relevant in this modern age or should we expect the church to evolve through time and its practices and even its message reflect the present culture as opposed to the picture we find in the New Testament? Can we simply go back and, might we say, cherry pick and uh, retain some of the things of the New Testament church that maybe we like and that we can get along with in this day and age, but, you know, the rest we can set aside and forget about? Some predict the ancient church cannot exist in a modern world, that if it does not evolve and change, it will die. They contend that restoring the ancient order is not only misguided, but futile. But was that Christ's vision for His church? Did he see it as an institution that would change throughout time and become something different than what he originally authored it to be? And Jesus said nothing, not even death, would prevent him from building his church in Matthew 16, verse 18, but what are its prospects for the future, however long that may be? There's an interesting statement the apostle makes in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. The inspired writer speaks of a time of great upheaval and transition coming in the lives of these Jewish Christians. He is urging them to remain faithful to Jesus, not to leave Christianity and return to the sacrifices of the Jewish temple. Some were tempted to do so because from their vantage point the future looked bleak for the church of Christ. Persecution and opposition were closing in and they could very well lose their lives if they followed Jesus and were numbered among His church. But the Hebrew writer says this in chapter 12 beginning in verse 23 and reading to verse 28. He says, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things which are, that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace, but which, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Well, of course, these verses are a study within themselves, and a very worthy study at that. But I want to think about one thing that this passage sets forth, and that is the permanency and the unshakable nature of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of Christ. He does not picture it as a transient thing, as a temporary thing, or as some sort of a fluid thing that is subject to the whims and the ways of man, but he pictures it as something that is sure and steadfast despite all of the change and upheaval around it. To put it simply, the temple city of Jerusalem and the temple within it, including its ordinances and sacrifices, would soon pass away with the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. But Christ and His kingdom would remain unshaken. He says, we have received a kingdom which cannot be moved. And the church may be threatened by different forces throughout time and subjected to different forces throughout time, but its future is sure. The church is a bedrock and a constant in this shifting and changing world. And today as we conclude our series on the New Testament church, I want to make some observations about the future of the church after a song.
When Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, perhaps his disciples did not understand the real impact of what Jesus would build. And maybe that's because they didn't yet really understand the rock that the church would be built upon. That rock was Jesus being the Christ. And just as death would not hold him prisoner in Joseph's tomb, but he would burst forth from that cold and musty grave to live forevermore, truly death, or the gates of Hades, would not prevail over him and would not keep him from building his church, doing what he said, fulfilling his promise. Little did his band of bewildered disciples know at that time the true impact that Jesus Christ would have upon history and upon the future of the world. Little did they then comprehend that they would be the foundation of a movement that would literally sweep the earth and transform it. When the prophet Daniel prophesied to King Nebuchadnezzar of the establishment of the church in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, he said, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. No other kingdom would overtake it nor destroy it. No power on earth nor hell beneath would bring it to ruin. It would stand and it will stand as long as time remains until it's delivered back up to God for all eternity. When you consider the fierce and vicious assault, though, that was unleashed against the church from its very inception, it's quite remarkable that it survived. But it did. Not only the world, but without, but forces from within have tried to lead it astray through false teaching, human doctrine, and tradition, and apostasy. Men have tried to improve upon it and dress it up to be more accommodating and palatable with the world around it. And all of this has led to the confusing, disillusioning, and discouraging state that the community that calls itself the church finds itself in today. But my friend, I want to cut through all of that, and I want you to know that truth still exists. The truth has not changed, and the church can still know that truth and follow it, and it must if we want to be the Lord's church and please Him. You can be a member of the same church revealed in the New Testament, and so can I. That church still means to Christ what it did when He established it. It is His bride. He is still the Savior of it, and He is still the head of it. The true church is still loyal and subject to the will of Christ. And if it's not, it no longer functions as the true church. You know, many are led to believe today that that church is waning, or that it has even disappeared. If it still exists, it's quickly fading and will soon vanish. We're told there's really nothing to the archaic and outdated precepts of New Testament Christianity, and that if we want the church to have any place in a modern world, we must learn to row with the current and assimilate to the prevailing voices of the majority. Thousands of years have passed, history has unfolded, and we are where we are, and we should just accept the present reality and move forward from there. Therefore, many, at the very least, scoff and many even oppose the idea of restoring the ancient order and insisting that we do Bible things in Bible ways. Some tell us that the New Testament church was never intended to be a pattern or model for the church in future generations, that the church was simply supposed to evolve and change, and it's really silly to want to go back and model ourselves after something so ancient. Well, I believe that the picture of the church revealed in the New Testament scriptures is more than just historically interesting. It is there to serve as a paradigm for the church that is dedicated to following Christ Jesus even yet today. The church of the first century was under the direct oversight of Christ's apostles as they lived and worked among those churches. They instructed them in how to serve and worship God, and they corrected them when they strayed from the truth. And those instructions and admonitions were written down and preserved through time, and it's called the New Testament, and they are there for us today as well. Again, not just as an interesting historical footnote. For one thing, the Bible tells us that the faith was delivered once and for all time to the first century saints. Jude said in Jude verse 3, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Well, you see, the faith is not some progressive and ever-evolving thing. It is the whole body of truth, and that's what the term the faith refers to. It is the whole body of truth delivered to the church, to the apostolic office, to believe and to follow. 
Now, some believe in what is called apostolic succession. That is to say, there is a long and unbroken line of authority in the church that started with the apostles and has continued down through the generations until today. We have people that possess the authority that the original apostles possessed. It is a line of succession, so they contend. And therefore, all of the traditions that have developed over time and through the centuries, they really bear the same weight in the church today as Scripture. That's not the case, though. Jude says, the faith was once for all delivered to the saints. Not only that, but the apostles also expected the church to maintain and keep the traditions that they were originally given to follow. For example, Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 1 and 2, a passage we've already noted in this series and in other sermons, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. Now first, Paul says there are traditions the church is to keep. Some translations say ordinances. There are ordinances or traditions the church is to maintain. Second, they are not just any traditions. They are the ordinances or traditions received from Paul the Apostle. Paul had taught them how to, or how to worship, how to organize the congregation, how to govern and conduct the work of the church. Remember that Paul told Timothy that he had written to him as well, that he might know, quote, how to conduct yourself in the house of God, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. So it, it matters what we believe, it matters what we practice, it matters how we conduct ourselves in the service of the Lord. Paul had instructed the church at Corinth as he did others and as the other apostles had instructed the churches they preached and wrote to. You see, Paul is saying that keeping the ordinances or traditions that the apostles of Christ delivered to the church, that's not an option, it's a command. God expects us to follow their teachings. Third, Paul says those traditions were to be followed as he delivered them, just as he delivered them. They had no right to change them or to do them in whatever way they saw fit. And friend, that alone should tell us that the approved practices of the New Testament church serve as a paradigm. They serve as a pattern. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, he said, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word, that is, when the apostles personally was in their presence and spoke to them, or our epistle. Here by traditions, he simply means all of the things the apostles had taught them concerning the belief and practice of the Christian faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 says that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. The scriptures, in other words, furnish us with the only knowledge and pattern we need to follow Christ and please Him. And furthermore, the apostles intended that their teachings and instructions be passed down beyond the people to whom they were originally given passed down to others and passed down to generations beyond the one to whom they originally wrote. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2 says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You see, the teachings of the apostles were intended to be preserved and passed along. And the question is, if we're free to set aside some of the examples of the New Testament, why not all of them? If we're no longer bound to follow the specific teachings of the apostles and do the things they enjoined upon the church in the way that they were taught to do them, and the examples of the church under their direction really are meaningless to us today, my question is, when did that change? When did the apostles' authority cease to be the apostles' authority? When did their words cease to matter? At what point did God say, all right, it doesn't matter anymore, do as you please? Friend, Either we follow the Scriptures or we don't. And if we don't follow the Scriptures, what do we follow? And how far are we willing to follow it? You see, the Scriptures are the only constant. The Scriptures are the only thing that doesn't change. Men's opinions change, trends change, fads change, the decisions of councils of men change, culture changes. But the Word of God doesn't change. And it's interesting that there are those who are lamenting the direction that churches are going in some things, but they readily embrace change and innovation in others. Again, friend, either the church is to be governed by the words of Christ and the apostles, or it isn't. We can't choose to be the same as the church of the New Testament in some things, but not other things. And if we're not trying to be the church of the New Testament, 
what church are we trying to be? Now, I believe the plea to restore the ancient order and be what the New Testament church was in faith and in practice is not only possible, it is a worthy plea and it is a biblical plea. The Bible says, if any man speak, let him speak only as the oracles of God. That's what Peter declared in 1 Peter 4.11. We are to speak only as God has spoken. The only plea, listen, the only way I should say that that plea becomes more than a platitude is if the Scriptures are our sole authority in what we preach and what we practice. We only practice those things for which we have scriptural authority. We speak as the Bible speaks, and we do Bible things in Bible ways, because as I say, the Bible hasn't changed. Friend, we still have the record of the church in the New Testament. It's, it, it is a marvel of providence that we have the New Testament record today. So we don't have to wonder about the things that the church represented and what it did and how it was organized and how it functioned. We don't, we don't have to wonder about the things the Scriptures reveal about those aspects of the church, what it looked like, how it was structured, how it was governed, how it worshiped, what it was called, what it preached, how to become a member of it. We've looked at all of those things over the past several weeks in our series. All of them are seen in the New Testament. And my question in this whole series simply is, why can't we follow those examples and imitate those things? Some act as though that's impossible. Friend, we can. It's simply a matter of will we? Are we willing to? Are we willing to lay aside our preferences? Are we willing to give up human dogma and human tradition in order to simply follow the examples and precepts of the New Testament? It may not be popular. It may not gain the largest crowd. It may not be cutting edge and in keeping with the times. But friend, think about it. What is cutting edge today will be old hat tomorrow. Isn't it better to let the Scriptures be our guide, the unchanging Word of God? The church does not depend upon your ingenuity or mine to keep it alive. The Word of God will never pass away, Jesus said, and His church will endure through the ages of time. And listen, it will be here when Christ Jesus returns for His bride. When the smoke of life's conflict is cleared away, the church will be standing. When the earth and all that is therein is burned with fire, the church will with Jesus live in glory and triumph forevermore. Friend, as we draw our series to a close, I want to ask, would you like to be a member of the New Testament church? You can be. That's a refreshing plea to me that you can seek out and find and be part of the New Testament church. You say, well, how in the world do you do that? You resolve to simply do what the Bible says, and if Somebody proposes doing something that the Bible does not authorize by precept, example, then you reject it. You don't be a part of that. You don't practice that. You become a member of the Lord's church, that church we've described, not by joining it, not by signing up for it, not by naming yourself as part of it. You don't ask some man or group of men to write your name on its roll. The Lord adds you to it when you become obedient to the gospel. And I believe that's where this quest to restore the New Testament church in your own heart and life must begin. Contrary to what the majority says today, Acts 2 verse 38 says to those lost in sin who desire to be saved, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, surely we can see a need right there to return to the pattern of the New Testament. Because today when people are asked, what shall we do? As those people asked on the day of Pentecost, they're often told, well, just ask Jesus into your heart. Just pray this prayer or uh, just uh, simply wherever you are, receive the Lord. But Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Not because your sins have already been forgiven, but for, in order to receive the forgiveness of your sins. And it says in verse 41, They who gladly received Peter's word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them some 3,000 souls. Added unto who? Unto what? The New Testament church. Verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. Which one did He add them to? Did they go join a denomination? No. The Lord added them to the church that He built. On what basis? on the basis of the relationship they had entered into with Him through obedience to the gospel. 
in faith and repentance, being baptized for the remission of their sins. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, For by one Spirit, that is, led by the Spirit of God through the gospel he revealed, we're brought to faith, taught to what we're taught to do by Him. By one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body. And Colossians 1.18 says Christ's body is His church. So we're baptized into the one church of the Lord. He says there is one body, the one He built, the one He is head over, the one, he, the one that follows His will and teachings, the one that worships Him in spirit and in truth. I ask, are you a member of it? Have you truly obeyed the gospel of Christ? You must believe His word. Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 verse 16 that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But that's not all. Faith that saves is faith that obeys. You must turn to Him in repentance from your sins, Luke 13, 3, or else you'll perish, you'll be lost. You must be willing to publicly identify with Him and confess your allegiance to Him as the Son of God, the Christ of God before others, or else He'll deny you, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Make the good confession. And if those things be the case, then you're ready to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness or remission of your sins. And when you do that, the Lord, because of His grace and mercy, will remit your sins and write your name in the book of life, and you'll be added to His glorious church. And you can identify with a local church that seeks to follow the New Testament in all matters of faith and practice and faithfully worship and serve Him until the day He comes for His bride and takes you home to live with Him in glory. And friend, if we can help you to seek the New Testament church, which Jesus built so long ago, we will be happy to assist you in doing so by looking with you into the Word of God. We would love to help you obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus and let Him add you to His church, which we read of in the New Testament. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Well, this brings our series of sermons on the New Testament church to a close. And if you would like a transcript of today's study, ask for the lesson, The Future of the New Testament Church, and we'll be glad to send it to you. You can also find all of the lessons involved in this series on our YouTube channel. Look for Let the Bible Speak TV, and please subscribe and like the videos while you're there. And you can also find them on our website, along with the transcripts at ltbstv.org. I hope that you will seriously consider what the Bible says about the church that you will launch an investigation into what that church was and how it worshiped and how it was organized. 
and that your plea and my plea will be to follow that example, to be what they were, nothing more and nothing less. And I'll say this, you can't go wrong in so doing. You'll follow a way that cannot be wrong and is surely right. We're so glad you've joined us today. I hope that you'll join me next week as we continue with another Bible study. Until then, I pray you have a great week ahead. May God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.